that for a long time. Um, and so now let's move on. Okay, to when it's likely to be a big problem and when it's not, probably so much of a problem. Here, we're fine, right? What do you guys think about this situation? Risky. Okay, risky, yeah. It depends on the minimum and the maximum. Of what? If you have, if you have the full range there, you, well, you don't know it. But, uh, well, does, does it look suspicious? I mean, perhaps the species response is going to crash right here, right? But is that what you're going to bet on? No. I mean, that's another line we could draw, which should, which means in that case we wouldn't be doing too bad, right? If we just said, okay, there's no prediction here, right? But let's also think about what are these options? So the way I've drawn this graphically, what what am I trying to portray here? In in the method of extrapolating an environmental space. What, what does this do? Just look at it and see what, tell me in your own words what this does. <coughs> the model that doesn't give an answer to those uh, values. Because after, this well, symmetric. it fits those values. Yeah, so it's a symmetric response, you were going to say? I'm thinking you should fit the model or to fit the curve and then the rest will be according to the fit. Yeah, okay, yeah. So you are assuming a symmetrical response and you are, well, there are some uh, techniques to do exactly that, right? Others are more, okay, let's make our model as good as we can in this region and then just let it go and see what it does. And so, and it down because we have this little bit of a peak right here, okay? What is this one doing? It's just saying yeah, it doesn't have effect. Yeah. Yeah, it's just saying above it, the threshold it doesn't have effect. Yeah, it continues, the response continues the same <coughs> as it was at the last point that we have data. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay? There's a couple names for that in the literature. This is one name for this is clamping. How many of you have seen that in the literature? Okay. So clamping is a term that I don't know exactly where it comes from, but it is keeping the response at the same as it was at the last point that where you have the data, right? So it's just saying, okay, flat line. That's what clamping is. And then that term is used a lot with MaxEnt, um, with regression-based techniques. It, they can be tricked into doing exactly the same thing. And um, in this paper I talk about, I cite a couple of uh, regression-based techniques that do, that do that, and I can't remember exactly what they're called in that context. Um, but you can do that with a GAM, for example. You can tell a GAM, when you have a truncation, this is how I want you to extrapolate. that way. Okay. So it keeps the same value like the last, where you last that information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What the way Maxent does it is it takes any environmental variable more extreme and it switches in the value for the last value you had. So that's how he tricks it into doing it. What if there was not a feature? Uh huh. <laughs> So what do you think about this situation? <laughs> so again, the, the flat line is slanting, right? The, the little dotted line is Continuing the response unconstrained, the model response is allowed to continue, right? Um, so, which situation would you rather be in? This one? Oops, what am I talking about? Or the previous? 
Would you rather be here or there? There. Yeah. So this is not good, but it's not yeah, as bad yeah. as that, right? Yeah. Okay. So, and you know, if that were, I mean, I've drawn it so it kind of eventually slowed down, but I mean, there's some responses you could get like this, and it could, and it quickly goes up to something very unreasonable, right? Okay. Um, but for example, if even if we're at this this situation, how reasonable is planting? What? Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> right? <laughs> but imagine, imagine this really is the right response. You then, can test it, of course, with your organism. Yeah. Say rainfall, like lots of rainfall, and you could test it in the, yeah. the so, experiment. Yes. The yes. Yes. Say, yes. Okay. So I think this is a, a place where, for some species that are amenable, mechanistic uh, experiments and models compared with this kind of uh, growth approach um, are really an, another in very interesting frontier. We're, we're comparing, even comparing the response curves over the range of conditions that exist in our study system is an open question. Yeah. Um, but <coughs> especially, how reasonable is the manner in which we extrapolate an environmental space? And that's an even better and bigger and scarier question, right? Sandon, I mean, you, you know your species really well. I, I, I've been working in North Africa with a snake, and, I, and then in the glacier period, it was even wetter, and, and the climate was, I'm quite positive that the areas that are, you know, the clapping areas would be more suitable, but mm -hmm. I guess most species don't. Right, but yes, and the question is, you know, up to what point? Eventually, presumably, there's a point when it's too wet for anything, you know, but where is that? Okay, so, I mean, red is used for a reason, right? <laughs> okay, um, so, I mean, one basic thing is, if your response is going down, then clamping probably becomes more and more unrealistic the farther you go. Whereas if your response is going up, then allowing it to continue that response probably becomes more and more unrealistic uh, as you go on compared to clamping, right? So if you're not if you're not extrapolating very far in environmental space, um, it may not make as much of a difference. But if you're uh, you're extrapolating farther, then the decision of how do you extrapolate becomes more and more important. Um, so, so, and that is something that we're going to have a presentation with, by Town about some of his research um, tomorrow. Um, and he's not going to present it, we're going to present it in slides. But he has some research about what happens when you choose different ways to extrapolate. Okay? And for all of this, I think it's very important to think about when we're extrapolating from the environmental space versus the idea simply of taking a model from one region and applying it to another region where we're applying in geographic space. So it's these transfers or these extrapolations in environmental space that are really, really problematic. Because you could have a model in one region, apply it to another region, if if those conditions are the same, the range of conditions is the same as your training region, you don't have any, uh, you don't have to extrapolate in environmental space because you don't have any non-analog conditions. You could even have truncated responses, but if you apply that to another region that, uh, that doesn't have any conditions more extreme, then you have no non-analog climate. Yes. Uh, one practical question, and much of the fade by clamping option. Can you explain in a few sentences what that means? That for We'd have to look in the documentation, because I know you can turn clamping on or off, <coughs> but the fade option I don't know off the top of my head. No, no. All right. Okay, so now another set of assumptions which have to do with the assumptions that we make when we choose our study region. So I'm not going to tell you operationally how to choose your study region, um, but I'll tell you what we're aiming for. So um, when we make a model and we pick our region for our comparison data, 
uh, our background data or absence or pseudo absence data, we are assuming that in this region, uh, factors related to dispersal, establishment, and persistence do not cause the species to occupy an environmentally biased subset of the abiotically suitable areas. So, so maybe you have a species in one mountain range here, there's suitable areas down there. If there's no environmental difference, it's actually not a problem. But if those are suitable here, but there's some variable that's different, and we only have our positive record from here, we have our comparison from the whole region, then um, dispersal-related factors are probably what are causing the species to occupy an environmentally biased subset of everything that's abiotically suitable. Okay? And it's not easy to know whether you're violating this or not, um, but, but this is something that we assume. Because you need this representative sample of what you're trying to model. If these kind of factors are giving you a biased sample, then you're not going to get what you want. The biotic noise assumption. We are assuming that biotic interactions do not cause the species to occupy an environmentally biased subset of the abiotically suitable areas. So exactly the same thing, but we're putting uh, biotic factors as this possible culprit that could cause this problem. And then I pulled humans out because it's important to think about us differently so we won't forget about us. So human, we assume that human modifications of the environment do not cause the species to occupy an environmentally biased subset of the abiotically suitable areas in our study region. So all three of these can be a problem. This one, especially, I mean, you think about humans have settled certain parts of the landscape and not others for a reason, right? There's a reason why, you know, there's a lot in temperate areas at least, there's a lot more um, uh, agriculture in lowland areas than in uh, highly, um, highly heterogeneous uh, mountains, right? There's a reason in uh, northern South America that people have settled in uh, the mountains and not in the lowlands, okay? The soils are better, there's not as many diseases, and, and um, so humans have not uh, converted the world uh, in a non-random way. So we have to think in our study region, what are the kind of the latent effects uh, of those non-random um, settlement patterns, right? So if our species is heavily affected by humans, um, to what degree might our sample be biased from what we really want to reconstruct? Okay, yeah. Um, so um, how do you do if you have a, a, a species with a phallisar in the peninsula a rocky lizard, but as soon as you go farther to the south, the lizard is not occupying some natural rocks areas, but it's mainly found in the cities. Oh, it's very curious. So, what do you do? Because they're, they're obviously violating this. Right, right. Yes. The, the, the lizard is occupying <coughs> the habitat that the habitat is completely here. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like there's an invasive parakeet in many parts of the world, a monk parakeet. Um, and it's, it's concentrated in a lot of urban areas. Um, so I would say, in this case, it would depend on your goal. Like if you were doing a phylogeographic study and you want to have something where you can reconstruct an older range uh, and compare with genetic data to see if it makes sense, I would exclude the records from the city. Um, if you are trying to, if, you know, if there's a species that's doing well in the city, you probably don't care about its conservation concern, but imagine you did, then maybe you would even have to model those as two separate entities. 
You model kind of the natural situations, and you model the anthropogenic ones, and, and then add them together. Um, okay. Any questions? Okay. So, um, so all together, these, we put these noise uh, assumptions together, and let's think about why I call them noise assumptions. So you can have a dispersal or um, demographic concerns or biotic interactions or human uh, effects that add noise to your data set, right? But they don't have any signal, and in this case, the signal would be a bias. So what we need to determine is, do these factors cause any bias of the environments that are occupied versus unoccupied? Um, but, but we can say, yes, there can be noise, right? We're not saying the species has to be at equilibrium with the, in, uh, the abiotic environments, because there can be some deviations from that. Um, but, into these factors, but we can't have any consistent signal that's going to bias our data. So all of these get down to the, it's the they have the same end, right? Uh, but the beginning of each assumption is just that particular factor, right? So we can think about them all together and the consequences. So if we have a violation of one or more of these, um, occupied niche space is going to be smaller than even the existing fundamental niche, OK? And uh, the species response is going to be truncated or more likely distorted for one or more abiotic variables. Okay? So that's not good. So recommendations. So use data, and this is both your positive data and your comparison data, from regions that either are in equilibrium uh, with the abiotic factors, or where um, you think that the limitations um, to the distribution are not likely to cause it to inhabit environmentally biased subsets of the abiotically suitable areas. Okay? So if we're, if we're in a system where the um, the species have good dispersal ability, um, we don't have demographic uh, concerns in any places, and biotic interactions are not causing a problem, the Eltonian noise hypothesis is true, we're at equilibrium with our abiotic environment and it's, it's fine, everything's fine. That's not a strict requirement, what, we, uh, what we're requiring is that there be no systematic biases by these kinds of factors. Um, so think very carefully about choosing your study region so that the kind of uh, limitations that are causing the species to inhabit uh, less than they could are not causing any systematic biases in environmental space. And again, I'm not going to tell you how to do that operationally, um, but you have to be a biologist and Defend your choice of the study region where you're going to make your models. Okay. 